Yeah, welcome to another lecture of the Educational Serious Industry Insights in cooperation with the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. Today I'm uh, very delighted to uh, talk about one of my favorite topics uh, within the blockchain and distributed ledger technology space. As you can already see, uh, today's presentation is about the tokenization of everything. And tokenization in the context of blockchain technology is not um, a new concept at all. Um, however, it gained um, momentum in recent years, especially this year, uh, when it comes to the tokenization of assets, the tokenization of um, uh, currencies, for instance, uh, putting a euro on the blockchain or DLT. And therefore, I want to take you today on a little journey through the basics, through the different applications and use cases, and of course, also in having an outlook onto the token economy as a new form of decentralized future. The whole uh, presentation is uh, split into four major parts. Uh, in part one, I want to give you a short introduction into the concept itself from, a, yeah, let's say, business and a technical perspective, what tokenization really means, what are the implications. In the second part, I want to talk about the different characteristics and properties uh, a token uh, can have and also um, yeah, introduce you to some uh, use cases and application areas. In the third part, uh, tokenization as enabler, uh, I want to show how this concept can be integrated and used um, for businesses to um, allow new innovation and new innovative services. And uh, this is especially important for financial industry today. And at the last part, the so-called token economy, I want to give you a short outlook and a status quo how a decentralized economy can have uh, uh, impact the, our society and our economy in the near future. Yeah, and um, before we dive into the topic, some introductionary remarks about my person. My name is Roger Heines. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Information Management at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And besides that, I'm working as a project manager at the Business Engineering Institute. And um, yeah, what we do is we combine research and practice and provide uh, inno innovative solutions uh, for our clients uh, around digital transformation and digitalization. And uh, one uh, important aspect, of course, are emerging technologies. As one part, we have, uh, for instance, artificial intelligence. And on the other, we have uh, distributed ledger technologies. And we also build uh, very practical solutions where we have, for instance, prototypes in the area of digital identity, in the area of uh, decentralized marketplaces, and so on. And um, we currently uh, associated with uh, competence center ecosystems where we have different research partners around the financial industry and the tokenization of assets, the digitalization of assets is one central part of our research and uh, our services and I'm therefore very delighted um, to uh, give you a short introduction into this very interesting and very important topic. In this uh, first part of our lecture, I want to introduce you to the concept of tokenization. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the background. I want a little bit talk about the basics and fundamentals. And of course, uh, I want to talk about how distributed ledger technology or blockchain uh, enables this new way to digitize uh, transactions. And um, this is very important, I think, uh, to understand what kind of implications this concept has on the way we transfer own issue and store value uh, in the near future. Yeah, and to better understand uh, this new phenomenon of tokenization, it is appreciated to take a look back at the history of Bitcoin, blockchain, and distributed ledger technology. As you can see uh, here, we already marked a special event uh, in our timeline. This was in 2010, the Bitcoin for Pizza transaction. And some of you might know that uh, um, somebody in an internet forum 
offered to deliver a pizza in exchange for 10,000 bitcoins, that would be totally unimaginable today because it would be the most expensive pizza ever. Um, but yeah, it somehow marked the um, start of this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which was uh, invented uh, one and a half years before by the pseudonym Satoshi Nagamoto uh, with its white paper and the start of the Genesis block in 2009. And the rest is uh, more or less history, where we had uh, an increase of the Bitcoin price in 2011. Then we had the mass adoption uh, in the darknet, in the deep web, where Bitcoin was used on illegal marketplaces uh, such as Silk Road. Then in 2014, we had the ICO of Ethereum, which is today known as the distributed world computer. And then in 2015, um, slowly the companies uh, were interested in the disruptive potentials of this new technology, where Nasdaq, for instance, explored um, uh, a proof of concept uh, or R3 and Hyperledger as um, new enterprise blockchain frameworks announced uh, the first projects. Then in 2017, uh, China already experimented with so-called decentralized currencies uh, and also in Switzerland um, the interest in blockchain technology started where SDX announced to uh, use distributed ledger technology as a new market infrastructure for uh, financial instruments and uh, also in 2019 um, we had the first so-called crypto banks in Switzerland uh, where they got their licenses to offer services for custody and trade of cryptocurrencies. And um, this year, also very important, the adaption of federal law to facilitate um, the introduction of so-called decentralized technologies. On the other side, um, there were always efforts to somehow implement some kind of uh, decentralized payment system we had in, um, uh, in the early days Adam Beck, who invented Hashcash, or we also had it by Dai with B-Money and Nick Sabo uh, with BitGold. However, in the end, yeah, some kind of centralized payment system uh, has been uh, widely adopted and established today. And uh, this was also uh, led by Elon Musk uh, with its predecessor to PayPal, XCOM. Yeah, and um, this is a story, uh, as we can see that, yeah, Bitcoin somehow survived and today it's a part of our, our digital system. And to understand what uh, the difference is between these payment systems, comparing, for instance, PayPal with Bitcoin, um, we have to understand which fundamental problem Bitcoin actually addresses. And therefore, we um, have a look at the digitalization of information, where we um, now draw a comparison uh, how the information in our physical world is digitized. And this is really easy. Um, we, for instance, have a newspaper. This is digitized uh, through uh, the servers, where we have the so-called uh, transaction control protocol, TCP, using uh, the internet. We send data blocks to a specific server. And when we can digitize the transaction, the data packages are more or less sent back uh, to our computer screen and we can read the newspaper article in the morning. But what about the digitization process considering the transfer of value in a physical world? This somehow works totally different because when we go outside uh, to a market or we go to a shopping mall, um, we give somebody um, our money, our cash, and in return we get the physical product. Um, when we want to digitize this process, it's not more or less intuitive like digitizing information. Why is that? Because we always need some kind of intermediary in the digital realm to address this kind of transaction. And Bitcoin, some, however, was first uh, a technology who allowed to transfer value in a digital world. And to exemplify 
uh, this process, um, I've brought a short example. So what you can see here is we have somebody from Switzerland who wants to transfer money uh, to someone from China. And in the background, we have the SWIFT system running. What SWIFT does, it holds some kind of centralized ledger where conducted transactions are stored safe. And this is important because in case of a dispute, if the Swiss person does not trust uh, the Chinese person, we have a trustworthy institution who can point out that the transaction already happened. And through Bitcoin and uh, distributed ledger technology, we have a new form or a new way to represent these transactions. And this is very interesting and exciting because uh, what the technology does in the first place is it replicates the centralized ledger. And uh, this is to prevent manipulation because uh, if an attacker wants to manipulate a specific row, it has to manipulate all uh, distributed ledgers. And um, so uh, attacker can be easily identified through a comparison between these ledgers. Um, of course, the idea to replicate data is not new and it's not very in innovative. But the really genius thing about blockchain and distributed ledger technology is a so-called consensus algorithm. And here you must understand that these ledgers have to be synchronized and updated all the time. And of course, there can be a conflict that when somebody has the same account um, and access to a specific row or transaction row and is using uh, the account at the same time, there can be a conflict between these ledgers. And now we have some kind of, let's say, multi-party consensus that allows us to, um, to synchronize uh, these ledgers without the need of a centralized system. Uh, and this is totally different, uh, as you know it from the SharePoint, where somebody uh, loads, uh, uploads a, a document, and then you have this case of conflict. And what distributed ledger technology allows is that we have equal participants who can upload uh, these transactions without relying on an intermediary. And now we have a new form to represent this kind of transaction which also have different benefits and also uh, disadvantages. As a result, this new technology allows us now to digitize and represent transactions in a new form, in an alternative way. And um, before Bitcoin, we have to rely on uh, third parties, on intermediaries, on trustworthy entities uh, will prove that a digital transaction actually took place. And many researchers in the community describe this as a paradigm shift where we had a so-called Internet of Information before. And in this Internet of Information, uh, we had to access servers, uh, we had to validate uh, the access, and through blockchain technology, uh, it is possible to move towards a so-called Internet of Value. And some researchers also proposed to um, digitize uh, every transaction and record every transaction on a blockchain uh, so that in a somewhere in future, uh, no intermediary uh, is necessary anymore and existing intermediaries like banks become obsolete. Of course, this was something that accelerated the hype around blockchain technology uh, because we know today that every use case uh, using this emerging technology has to be assessed individually. And um, that blockchain, of course, is not the holy grail for anything. However, the idea of digitizing transactions to record uh, the transfer, to record ownership, issuance, and storage, uh, this makes sense, and especially for assets, for existing assets and objects, uh, it is uh, important to keep that in mind that we now have the choice between these two uh, information systems. And each system or each uh, paradigm comes, of course, with different uh, benefits and disadvantages. 
also the idea of storing transactions uh, of an object on a distributed ledger is also formally known as tokenization. Um, but what is tokenization actually and what can be tokenized? And to answer this question, we conducted a brief literature review on uh, different reports and research papers. And as you can see here, the authors describe the process very differently. On one side, um, they talk about the process of converting rights of an asset. On the other side, they talk about the representation of pre-existing real assets. And in another case, they talk about physical items used in supply chain management or for intellectual property. And this is also somehow reflected uh, in practice where we explored what a token actually represents. And therefore we analyzed 33 fintechs who provided a so-called token assurance services. And uh, as, you, as you can see here, um, existing assets are mostly tokenized, for instance, company shares, bonds, or other uh, financial instruments. Then we have uh, real estate, cars, art, metal materials. Interestingly, 10% uh, of the token represent usage rights. Uh, then we have capital stock in form of machines. Uh, currencies are tokenized as well as luxury goods or collectibles such as wine, watches or gemstones. This leads us um, finally to, uh, yeah, let's say, a more generic uh, definition of tokenization. And uh, in our definition, tokenization uh, is a process of creating a thing uh, in form of a smart contract, uh, a token on a blockchain. And the idea is that generally you can tokenize everything. However, to uh, instantiate or contextualize uh, this token, two additional aspects are necessary. First, uh, it is necessary to establish a legal relationship to this specific object. And secondly, it is necessary to assign a specific bearer. This could be a legal person or a natural person. And if these three things, if these three aspects are met, so the object, the legal relationship, and its bearer, uh, the token becomes subject for a specific case or for a specific application area. And this is very interesting because now, of course, a token can digitally represent anything that ranges from an asset or digital good to a license or digital property. However, uh, once the legal relationship is established, you can specify the token. For instance, you have a, a smartwatch, which is, which is tokenized. Uh, it can be, of course, represent an ownership right to a bearer or for instance, a usage right. But this definition is necessary to um, specify the token into a specific context. And um, this is the first part of our lecture series. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and um, looking forward uh, to our second part. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, uh, let me know in the comments.